In this video, we're going to talk some more about the shell model and a special kind of experiment called photoelectron spectroscopy that will allow us to generate some more data that we can use to kind of validate our model. So remember, models are things that we humans invent in our head. They are not real. We think that they represent reality insofar as they can describe or explain experimental data. So let's think about currently what we have for our shell model for the electronic structure of the atom. Here we have a neon atom, right? So neon has an atomic number of 10, so there's a plus 10 charge in the nucleus. And we've got this first inner shell that has two electrons, and then the rest of the eight electrons are in, in the second shell. So that's our current model. So in this outer shell, our valent shell, we have eight electrons. So any one of these electrons, like this guy right here that I've got my little hand pointer on, um, might feel uh, a, an attraction to the nucleus, but because the inner shell electrons are screening or shielding some of that nuclear charge, we say that that electron feels an effective nuclear charge. And we can model what that effective nuclear charge is by this idea of core charge. So those two inner shell electrons are going to offset some of the positive charge. Since each electron has a minus one charge, they're going to off offset one unit of charge. So plus 10 for the nuclear charge, minus this negative one, and this negative one gives us a plus eight core charge. And you'll remember that the number of valence electrons and the core charge on the atom are always equal. So this is our model. Um, let's think a little bit about what it says. So we've got two different kinds of electrons in this model. Those that are in the first shell, the inner shell, and those that are in the outer shell, the valence shell. So each of these two electrons is going to feel a different kind of attraction to the nucleus. And we can think about what that is by using Coulomb's law to calculate the potential energy PE. So Coulomb's law says the potential energy is equal to some constant K, a positive constant, times Q1, that's the charge on one particle, times Q2, that's the charge on another particle, and D is the distance between them. So if we're thinking about one of these outer valence electrons, and they're all the same, right? So if we're thinking about one of these outer valence electrons, um, the Q1 charge is going to be the charge on that electron, so a minus one. So let's go ahead and write that in here. So we're looking at the outer shell, so maybe I'll write that down here, PE. We'll put a subscript V for valence electron, VE, potential for a valence electron. So it's going to be K. Q1 is minus 1 because that's the charge, let's say, on this electron. So we need to figure out what other charge is this electron interacting with. So we're thinking about the energy to remove that electron. So that electron is going to be attracted to something. What is it attracted to? Well, the nucleus, but the nucleus that gets screened by these two inner shell electrons. So it's going to be attracted to, let's say, the plus 8 core charge. And then it's some distance from the nucleus. Now we've got two different distances in this model. The outer shell is further away from the nucleus than the inner shell. So we need to sort of figure that out somehow and include that in our calculations. So one thing that we could do is just include symbols, right? But in order to get sort of a more uh, numerical sense of things, let's just arbitrarily pick two distances. It doesn't matter that they're right. It only matters that the valence shell is further away from the nucleus than the inner shell. So let's say that the valence shell is 100 picometers away from the inner shell. All right, so if we do all this math, what we're going to get is 8 times negative 1. That's going to be a negative 8. So we've got negative 8k over 100 picometers. Presumably the units on K are such that they cancel out the picometers here, and we've put in relative charges instead of absolute charges, so these charges aren't in coulombs, which would be the SI unit, so we just put them in as relative charges. So presumably their units on K are such that everything would cancel out, and we get energy in like joules. So that's the potential energy of a valence electron. Let's calculate the potential energy of an inner electron. So I'm going to call that IE for inner electron. So that's going to be K. So if we're looking at one of these inner electrons, like this guy, again the charge on that electron is minus 1. And we're going to figure out what charge it's interacting with. So what's holding it there? Well, it's attracted to the nucleus, and there are no other electrons in front of it, so we're going to use that full nuclear charge. So that's going to be a plus 10. 
and then it's going to be much closer to the nucleus. So how much closer? We don't know. Let's just put in a number that's smaller than 100. How about 50? So now we're going to do the calculation here. We've got negative 10k divided by 50 picometers. All right, so if you imagine that we stuck some numbers in here, like 1 for k or something like that, you would see that the potential energy for the valence electron is higher, closer to zero, than the potential energy for the inner electron. And we can represent that by something called an energy level diagram, and you guys have seen these before. So this axis right here just represents energy increasing as we go up. So I'm going to write energy there. So down here there's a low energy level, and that's going to be for the inner shell, the inner electrons. So that'll be for the n equal 1 shell. And that would be this value. So it's negative, right? So this is negative. So we're going to put another little mark up here. That's 0. So how would you get 0 potential energy? Well, you could have 0 charges. But another way to get 0 potential energy is imagine that this distance right here went to some really, really large number, started approaching infinity. So that would mean that you've taken one of these electrons and moved it all the way out to infinity. Well, that's what we do when we ionize an atom. When d goes to infinity, potential energy goes to 0. So at this level right here, this is when we have ionized an electron off of our atom. So the electrons um, in the inner shell, i.e., shell number n equal 1, have lower energy than the uh, valence shell electrons. So I'm going to draw another little tick mark right here and draw a little line to represent the valence shell, the valence electrons. And so that'll be the second shell here. OK, so I told you we have different kinds of electrons. So two of the electrons are in this lower shell. And so they're going to have a really low energy. The other eight electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, are up here at this higher energy. Now, what, how much energy would we have to put in to ionize one of these electrons? Well, it depends which electron we pick. If we pick one up here, then we've got to take this electron in the valence shell and take it out to infinity. d gets to infinity. Potential energy goes to 0. So what we're doing is putting in enough energy to take it from this energy level, which is negative, up to 0. So you see we're increasing our energy. And the length of this line on this axis tells me how much energy I have to put in. So that is the ionization energy. So pick an electron, whatever energy it starts at, you have to put that much energy in to take it to 0 to ionize that electron. And so what you'll see is that these two electrons, the two different kinds of electrons, the ones in the inner shell and the valence shell, should have two different ionization energies. So that is a prediction from our model that we will have two kinds of electrons with two different kinds of ionization energies. So it would be great if we could actually test that. That would make us feel better about our model if we could actually show that we had two different kinds of electrons and only two different kinds of electrons with these two different energies. So we should get two different ionization energies depending on which electron we take out, either a valence electron or an inner shell electron. So right now the experiments that we have talked about to measure first ionization energy, um, they're going to just remove an electron from the outer shell. So we need a different kind of experiment to remove electrons from any shell. And that experiment is called photoelectron spectroscopy. So this is the preview to photoelectron spectroscopy. Now you know why we might want to do it. So we want to design an experiment that will let us ionize the electrons from any shell of the atom. So how might we do that? So we're going to do this by using a modification of the photoelectric effect. You'll recall that the photoelectric effect was studied by Albert Einstein. And it was that effect that led him to conclude that light comes in these little tiny packets of energy, a smallest possible packet of energy that he called a photon. And so that gave the idea that light could be thought of as perhaps having a particle like nature. And the photoelectric effect was the effect that he studied to lead him to that conclusion. But basically the idea is that you shine light onto a material, and if the light has enough energy, it can cause an electron to be knocked off of that material. So we imagine that we've got, let's say, this neon atom up here, and we've got a photon coming in. So this little wiggly line represents a photon. So this is kind of like the wave model, right? So there's a wave coming in here. So that photon has a certain energy that Albert Einstein tells us with his 
equation. So the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency nu of that photon. So we've got a photon coming in here. Now if that photon has enough energy, more energy than one of these ionization energies, it can remove any one of these electrons, knock it off. And when it knocks off that electron, so let's say it knocks off this electron right here. So that electron has gone flying away. So let's uh, draw a little picture of that electron. There it is, and it's going flying away. It continues moving that way, like that. And so when it gets knocked off, it's going to be moving at a certain speed. And we know that when things are moving, they have a certain kind of energy that is energy of motion, and we call that energy kinetic energy. So the reason we're thinking about this is that the energy of this photon went to two places, right? So first, the energy had to be strong enough to take that electron from this energy level, the valence shell, and pull it out a good distance away. So we've removed that electron, we've ionized it. So we have to overcome the binding energy first. And then we have to give that electron a little extra kick to keep it moving and flying away. So that's kind of the basis of the photoelectric effect. And so what we can say then is we can write down a little equation that says that the energy of the photon, and because energy is not created or destroyed, that's a fact from physics called conservation of energy that Albert Einstein and others knew about at the time. So the energy of the photon can't just go away, it has to go somewhere. So in describing this process, it went to two places. The first place it went was overcoming the binding energy. So we had to put in enough energy to ionize whichever electron in this atom that we're talking about. And the other place that it went was to give that electron some energy of motion, what we call kinetic energy. Now a little reminder from physics, if there's a particle that's moving, there's an equation that we can use from physics to calculate the kinetic energy. So kinetic energy, it turns out, is equal to 1 half times the mass of the particle, m, so electron will have a certain mass, times its velocity squared, so v for velocity. And really what we're using here for velocity is um, just the magnitude of the velocity, so how fast it is moving, its speed. Velocity is really what we call a vector quantity because not only are you moving at a certain speed, but you're moving in a certain direction. And we want to have both of those pieces inf of information in velocity. So speed is just the um, how fast you're going component of that without the direction added in. So we're going to take the speed and we're going to square that, multiply it by the mass, multiply that by 1 half, and that's the kinetic energy of any moving particle. Now we're not going to use this equation any more than to just remember that the speed, how fast that electron is moving, is related to this kinetic energy. So if we knew the speed, and because the mass of an electron is a known quantity, we could calculate its kinetic energy. So we just really care about knowing that kinetic energy is related to speed in some way. Okay, so if we think about this equation here and doing this experiment, um, measuring the uh, energy of a photon actually isn't all that hard to do because we can measure the frequency of that photon. What we'd like to figure out is what is ionization energy because we're trying to measure the ionization energy of these electrons that are in these different energy levels, either in the valence shell or the inner shell. So the other thing that we're going to need to come up with in this experiment is a way to measure then the kinetic energy of the electron. So how do we do that? That's what we're going to need to do. So let me describe for you the setup, the schematic setup of a photoelectron spectroscopy experiment. So what we have here is a, a container, a box. And this will typically be an evacuated uh, system. So there'll be a big steel container, a big steel can, so we can pump out all of the gases inside there, so it's at really low pressure. And then we leak in through a little tiny hole, a little stream of gas phase atoms. So G here is standing for gas phase. And so we've got atoms going in here. The other side, we've got a window that's transparent to radiation, and we're gonna shine photons in there. Now these photons need to be really high energy so that we can be sure that we rip off electrons. So we're gonna need either UV photons or probably X-ray photons. So remember that those regions of the electromagnetic spectrum have really high energies. So these are really high energy photons. When the photons smack against the atoms, they have a chance of ripping off an electron. So we're gonna imagine that, um, here's some little dots. So electrons go flying out, perhaps in all different directions. 
Some of them will exit through this hole, and we can actually attract them by making this hole kind of positively charged, and so we can pull the electrons out through there. Now the next piece of this apparatus, we're going to get, have these electrons pass through another container, and this container has two curved metal walls. So there's one curved metal wall, and here's another curved metal wall. And what we can do with these metal walls is that we can connect them to a voltage source. And so we can charge this side up, this curved side up, so that it is negatively charged. So I'm going to draw a whole bunch of minus signs against that wall to remind us that it's negatively charged. The other wall down here, this curved wall, if we connect it to a voltage source, we can make it charged the opposite charge. So we can give it a positive charge. So what's going to happen to these moving electrons? Well, these electrons may all be moving at different speeds. Remember, we talked about kinetic energy out here. And so the photon may have given them enough of a kick that they're really flying. So the electrons that are moving really fast, they're going to start flying this way. But they see that negative charge, and they get repelled a little bit, and they're attracted to this positive charge. But they're moving so fast that it's not enough to stop them, and they end up crashing into that wall. Other electrons might be moving really slowly. So these electrons that I just drew over here, these are the fast electrons. And then there might be some other electrons that are moving really slowly. And so they get repelled and attracted to this positively charged wall. And they collide with that wall pretty early. So these electrons would be moving slow, have low velocities. But there might be some electrons that are moving at just the right speed to get curved exactly around this tube and come out the other end. All right. So they get curved around that tube. And what happens to them when they come out the other end? Well, that's where we're going to put a little detector. So the detector is just going to be probably a little piece of uh, metal, metal mesh, a little uh, piece of metal that we can charge up positively. So we're going to make this positively charged. So the electrons are attracted to that. They're going to crash into this positive charge uh, piece of metal. And then they're going to generate a little electric current. So anytime we have electrons flowing in wire, or anytime we have any charges moving, that's an electric current. So physicists use the symbol I to represent current. So there's just a little electric current. We can take that electric current, amplify it, and measure it. So it's a way of having us measure the number of electrons that are coming out. So by changing the voltages on these two metal plates, we can actually move even really fast moving particles to our detector, or really slow moving particles can get them bent around. And so we're going to change the voltages on these metal plates. And as we do that, electrons with different kinetic energies are going to come out. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to sweep this voltage, and we're going to measure electrons with all their different kinetic energies. So if we know the frequency of the photons going in, and we can measure with this kinetic energy analyzer. That's this piece of the photoelectron spectroscopy instrument over here. By the way, we were talking about photoelectron spectroscopy here. Oh, by the way, I should probably deconstruct this name for you a little bit. So photoelectron relates to the photoelectric effect. The photo part means light, and electrons are what's getting knocked off. And spectroscopy is any kind of experimental technique that uses light to, po uh, to probe matter. So that's what photoelectron spectroscopy is. Sometimes it's abbreviated PES in the literature, so photoelectron spectroscopy. Sometimes it's called XPES for um, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So this part of that instrument is the uh, kinetic energy analyzer, and it lets us get at this piece. So if we know the energy of the photon and we know the kinetic energy or can measure it for the electrons, we can measure the ionization energy. So the data from this kind of experiment looks like a plot of, on this axis, it's electrical current. But current is really proportional to, so I'm going to draw a wiggly line, which means proportional to uh, the number of electrons. All right, so we're going to get bigger signals the more electrons are coming out and hitting our detector down here. And then this axis is going to be ionization energy. That's what we can calculate from this equation once we know the energy of the photon and the kinetic energy of these electrons as they come out of our kinetic energy analyzer. And so what we'll get is a peak. When the ionization energy is just right, we're going to remove electrons. And the higher the peak is, so the peak height, also sometimes called the intensity, the peak height is related to the number of electrons in that energy level. So let's go back and think about what we might expect to see 
um, in, in this picture. So this picture with neon has lots of electrons in there. So I'm actually going to draw a pretend atom, an energy level diagram for a pretend atom that might be a little bit easier for us to think of and draw. All right. So we're going to imagine an atom. Here's zero, right? So that's when we've ionized it. We're going to still have two energy levels in this atom. But we're going to imagine that in this fictitious atom that I've got two electrons here and three electrons up here. Okay. And let's go ahead and put some energies in here. Let's imagine that this energy distance from the bottom to zero is, let's say that that is six megajoules per mole. And let's say from this upper energy level to the zero line to ionize those electrons, that that's only one megajoule per mole. All right, so different ionization energies. So let's think about what the photoelectron spectrum might look like for this experiment. So our photons can come in and they can remove either the electrons in the higher energy level or the lower energy level. So both of those. So we're going to draw number of electrons over here on this axis, and ionization energy here. So at low ionization energy, then we would expect to see a peak down here. And that's when we get to an ionization energy. I'm going to draw this one a little bit taller. You'll see why in a minute. All right, so draw a little tick mark there. What is that energy? Well, that's going to be 1 in units of megajoules per mole because when we get to that energy, we're able to pluck those electrons off. Now we're going to get to higher energy, so way down here at 6, we're going to get another peak. So right here at 6 megajoules per mole, we get another peak. So notice that the heights are not the same, so I've drawn these little lines on top so we can compare the heights. There are three electrons in the lower energy level, so this height should be uh, proportional to three electrons, so this should be three units high, whereas this peak over here should only be two units high. So I probably need to draw that a little bit higher. There we go. We're going to draw that a little bit higher. So now if this is two units high, so here's one unit, two units, and this one is three units high. One, two, three. So we sort of, in our eye, divide it up into three segments. And we can see that this peak is about three high, whereas this peak is about too high. So they have this ratio of peak heights, 3 to 2. And that's corresponding to the fact that there are 3 electrons in the higher energy level and 2 ele electrons in the lower energy level. Now, what I mean by lower energy level is that these guys are lower in energy and it's going to therefore take more energy. It takes 6 megajoules to pull those electrons off. So that's an example of a photoelectron spectrum for um, a particular atom. So we're removing all of the electrons, and this convinces us that we've got two and only two energy levels, and we can measure the energies, the ionization energies of these electrons that are in the different energy levels. And the peak height tells us something about the relative number of electrons in each of those levels, energy levels. So let's do one more thing. Let's go back and predict what we might expect to see from our model of neon up here. So if we look at our model for neon, We've got two electrons in the inner shell. Those are lower in energy. And we've got eight electrons in the higher energy shell. So what is that going to look like? So here's the predicted photoelectron spectrum, PES, for neon. All right, so I'm going to draw my axes. This axis is going to be relative number of electrons. Really what we're measuring is a current, but a current is proportional to the number of electrons. That's why we use this term relative, because it's kind of proportional. And down here, this axis is ionization energy. So at low ionization energy, we're going to have a really tall peak corresponding to those eight electrons. All right. So we don't know what that energy is, although it's probably going to be the first ionization energy for those electrons, but it's going to be a low ionization energy. And then as we increase, um, energy, eventually we're going to come to the point where we've put in enough energy to ionize those um, electrons that are in the uh, inner shell. And there are two of those. So if this peak is 8 units high, so it's supposed to be about 
eight units high, then this next peak needs to be two units high. So that's gonna be a quarter of the height of the eight height peak. So let me try to draw something about like that. So that should be about a quarter of the height of this peak. So this peak is gonna be two units high, and it's gonna occur at a much higher energy. So if this one is um, one, we might expect this one to be eight megajoules per mole. I'm just guessing there. So this is just a predicted spectrum. All we really know is that there should be a big energy difference between these two peaks. And so that's what we would expect to see if our shell model is correct. So now what we have to do is actually go out and do the experiment and figure out does the experiment match with our prediction based on our model. If it doesn't, we might have to go back and modify our model so that it now fits with experiment. But I'm going to save that as a surprise for later to look at the photoelectron uh, spectrum for neon.